was convicted of six counts of wire and bank fraud. All right, we're being joined now by two legal experts for their takes on today's developments. We have Luke and Brian Sheely. Guys, you were with us earlier in the week. We appreciate you coming back. Thanks for having us. Let's talk about the testimony from Greer today, the SLED agent talking about able to identify the shell casings at the crime scene, identifying them as uh, finding other shell casings on Murdoch's property, most likely coming from the same gun. What do you guys take on that? Well, uh, expert Greer is a very damaging witness, um, very helpful there, for the there. state. He, there? he testifies to there, some very fascinating things and that, well, number one, he has the one blackout 300 rifle in evidence. Now, I don't think the state's trying to say that that's the gun. They test fire that against shell casings. It's inconclusive. If it were a match, he would have said it's a match. Um, but what's really damaging for the defense and something they tried to keep out altogether was that they took those six shell casings around Miss Murdoch's body and they compared it to other shell casings found amongst the property, specifically at the side of the house where I think it was Mr. young man Mr. Loving said he was test firing the replacement rifle and also other shell casings at the gun range, so to speak. And they didn't say that they matched in terms of test fire, but it was mechanical marks from cycling through and ejecting, not being fired, that match essentially the bullets around, or the casings around Miss Murdoch, which means it's not a stranger gun, it's a Murdoch family blackout 300 gun. And that's just a devastating blow to the defense, which is why they're desperately trying to attack the science of that and in a pretrial filing, keep it out altogether. How does Dick Harputley and how does Jim Griffin attack that, Brian? It's going to be tough. And, you know, before Paul Greer's testimony, I was under the assumption just based on the level of pre-trial uh, legal analysis and kind of voir dire of this particular witness that potentially the defense has their own firearms expert. But now the way uh, Jim Griffin was cross-examining Mr. Greer and kind of just uh, attacking the science altogether, it makes me think they don't have a firearms expert that they intend to use and they really were just going to kind of discredit his uh, base of knowledge which is really tough to do on Mr. Greer. Right. The defense already has a tough task right now because of a couple of things that happened earlier this week. The dog kennel video in which two people said they heard Alec Murdoch's voice on that dog kennel video basically putting Alec Murdoch at the crime scene minutes before those murders took place. How does, how does the defense square this up with Murdoch's story that he was napping at the home at the time and never went to the dog kennel? Well, I think if you're not, if you're in a case where you're not having to deal with all these unrelated financial crimes, then perhaps Mr. Murdoch, who's a lawyer and is savvy, can get up there and do some explaining, so to speak, say, look, you know, I, sure, I'm going to hold my hand up. I didn't exactly want to maybe tell you I was down there, but let me let me do some explaining and we can talk about it. And, oh, yeah, I remember that. But it's very tough to do that. But number one, that's why you don't ever talk to police, regardless of your education, background, skill set, if you're potentially under investigation, because they have that um, inconsistency to call him a liar. But he's still, that defense is going to have to explain that. The problem is if Judge Newman lets in all those crimes, He's going to get pounded with allegations on that, going to have to plead the fifth on every one of them, which is, is not a good look in front of the jury. Brian, would the defense have an easier time explaining the change of clothes? That Snapchat video showed him wearing one thing. He was wearing something else later that night when police arrived on the property. I mean, he was out and about, I guess, on a farm that day, right? Yeah, I mean, I think if he's prepared to testify, he would legitimately be able to say that maybe he took a shower before his nap or after he changed clothes. He was working with Paul that day, looking at trees on the property. And there's a lot of different reasons to have a uh, change of clothes. Um, maybe he was gonna change clothes before he went to see his mother. I mean, there are explainable things, but it is all in the light of him telling law enforcement that he wasn't at the kennel when two very uh, credible witnesses based on their testimony said that's definitely his voice. So like I said, He's likely going to have to testify, but if the other crimes and the financial malfeasance comes in, he's going to be jammed. Let's talk about that for just a moment, because that's been the focus of a lot of attention over the last couple of days. The judge, Judge Newman here, said he hasn't made a final decision on what he will and will not allow.
He did agree with the prosecution that the defense did open the door for the financial crimes, uh, the alleged financial crimes against Murdoch to be presented as a possible motive in all of this. But let's say all of this that we've heard over the last couple of days is allowed in the testimony. How does that affect the trial, Luke? He's done. Murdoch's done if all those crimes come in. And it's a, it's a, I don't mean that lightly. It's a very weighty decision for Judge Newman. He did say that the defense opened the door by a line of questioning they had, I think, on one of the friends of, mm -hmm. of Paul. Right. And I can't say I disagree with him, but it's, it's such an important decision that if you, you know, the, this jury is tasked with trying this double murder case based on the facts and evidence here, not, you know, numerous terrible, unrelated financial crimes. Yes, they have a, a right to establish a motive, the state mm -hmm. does, and tell their story. But the defense, you know, makes a pretty good point. Well, this, this wasn't a distraction from his financial crimes. This put an international microscope on his life. Right. And I, I think I would submit that I don't think that they necessarily would have discovered the financial crimes had the killings not happened. Um, I think they might have found a way to have him pay it back. I mean, this is a very prominent law firm. It was very embarrassing. So if it comes in, it, it's also an appellate issue. You know, you really, no one wants to try this case again if you can't help it. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a vested interest in, in trying a clean case. So Judge Newman's going to be thinking about that. Um, but he's a strong-willed judge, and he's going to do what he thinks is right at the end of the day. You agree with your brother on all of this? Absolutely. I think it, he, he's done if it comes in. He mm -hmm. couldn't effectively testify in his own defense because he will be grilled on other crimes and allegations that are pending. The jury will be done with him. I mean, for instance, the testimony of the Satterfield son was heart-wrenching today. And that is maybe one of the most credible witnesses we've heard all week. The way he talked about the trust that was lost, how he felt like Alec was his lawyer. Uh, devastating. And, you know, my opinion is that kind of other crimes and acts testimony with pending charges should never come into this murder trial for right. it to be clean. But if it comes in, he'll have no answer for that. Right. The alleged financial crimes are one thing. Uh, there is really right now, as far as I know, no physical evidence connecting Murdoch to all of this. A lot of circumstantial evidence, which is not looking good for Murdoch right now. Everything that's come out in court this week. Right. I mean, we started off talking about this case as a circumstantial case, but it's it's a strong circumstantial case. Mm -hmm. And you heard uh, the state in their opening discuss how a case can be circumstantial, but that doesn't mean it's any less important or, or, or somehow is less good evidence. It's just it's more of an inference than like a direct confession or a direct ID. And it's it's the inference of the cover up. You know, they're going to say a, a created, you know, you know, manufactured alibi, the cleanness of his shirt, the missing weapons, the convenience of, it, of how he found them. All that is just ticking, 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 ticking into beyond a reasonable doubt land. And plenty of cases has been won based on circumstantial. So that's the other thing. I don't I don't know that they need the financial crimes. The mm -hmm. financial crime evidence makes it a slam dunk. But does it make it a slam dunk conviction for the right and fair reasons? Um, that's the other question. So it's still a very strong circumstantial case. The lack of blood spatter in this case when it comes to Alec Murdoch, something Dick Harpootlian touched on in court just yesterday, Brian. He was asking the sled expert on the stand, did you find one speck of blood? Did you find this? Did you find that? And her answer was no. There was nothing inside the home as far as blood evidence is concerned in this case. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. And they have to hit that point hard. I mean, you know, I think the state would, of course, if he were wearing a bloody shirt, he'd be guilty. <laughs> um, the fact that he's too clean, guess what? He's guilty. So, I mean, that's going to be the state all day long. And Dick Carpullian, all for the past two weeks, has done a really good job of chipping away at the professionalism of the local law enforcement mm -hmm. and even the, the sled agents that, were, that are supposed to be some of the best law enforcement in the state, you know, you know would have either done things better than the locals did or didn't quite do things the right way. And so that is Dick Carpullian's job yeah. as uh, Mr. Mur Murdoch's defense lawyer and part of the team. But yeah, 
it's uh, it's one of those things that either way you spin it, it can be spun. Let's talk about next week now. Testimony is going to resume, I believe, on Monday morning around 930 or so. Of course, there's more financial, alleged financial crime testimony that the judge is going to hear as well. But what's next here? The, the, the prosecution, the state, they've been laying out their case day by day by day, landing blow after blow after blow. Are there any more blows to land next week? Certainly. Um, we haven't heard from DNA yet. I don't know that it's going to be particularly earth shattering one way or the other. In, I've never had a murder case where we don't hear from the pathologist. Mm -hmm. And again, there's mechanisms and, and causes of death, particularly a pathologist is well equipped to talk about distance, you know, stippling, things, things of a scientific nature that can help describe how close the assailant might have been to the victim. So I would expect we would hear from a pathologist. They do tend to introduce a lot of pretty gory photos in that, which can overwhelm a jury. Um, so I think, I think the state is probably two thirds of the way there. And then it's, what do we do with the financial stuff? Does it come mm -hmm. in or not? And if that comes in, we got a lot, lot, that could be all next week. <laughs> and Luke, one thing we, and JR, one thing we haven't mentioned is, and we were debating this earlier on today, the associate of, of Mr. Murdoch who, you know, allegedly tried to help him commit suicide. So, you know, evidence of suicide, you know, is a powerful bit of evidence. It's been heavily litigated in South Carolina, but the state would often try to show it to show a guilty conscience. Right. And that would, be, now that has not been part so far of these other bad acts, but it certainly would play a part here. And I imagine the state will be seeking to have that witness's testimony come in and anything that Mr. Murdoch said to that witness in conjunction with planning the attempt on his own life, any, any guilty words, any guilty acts, um, could certainly be used against Mr. Murdoch. I want to bring up something else about the alleged financial crimes here, something I heard uh, the judge tell both sides in court. Basically, the state wants to present this evidence. The defense says it shouldn't be allowed. Okay, we get that. The state's got a long list of witnesses they want to present when it comes to this. The defense says, well, if you do that, it's going to add probably at least a couple of weeks onto this trial. We're going to be here till March or at least to the end of February. So the judge basically telling both sides, kind of work this out amongst yourself. Let's uh, try, try to get some sort of agreement here. If you guys can't get to some sort of agreement on what, what we're going to do moving forward, I'll make that decision for you. And he said, I have no problem hearing that testimony. You guys think they're going to work something out or is the judge going to make a ruling here? I don't see any way that the defense can work something out on that issue that they've so mm -hmm. heavily contested because if they do, they essentially consent to it. They lose all right to, to appealing that particular issue. You know, Judge Newman is very experienced and, and it would pretty much evaporate any chance of appellate issues if they did work something out. So I think perhaps the judge is for efficiency purposes, wanting that, and also for appellate reasons, wanting that. Um, I, I can't see any way that Mr. Harputlian and Mr. Griffin agree to work something out. I think they has, they've drawn a line in the sand. The state wants it in, they can't have it, and the judge will make a decision. It's either coming in or it's not, and I think he's gonna let parts of it in, and then it's just, what does he let? Does he let the Satterfield portion in? Does he let the day of the killings confrontation by, by his law firm in, mm -hmm. which might be perhaps the most relevant to what happened in his mind that day. So I think you'll be in a situation where the judge will be making that call. And that is another blow that the prosecution landed just yesterday, Brian, when the uh, uh, woman from the law firm uh, testifying <coughs> that Murdoch was confronted about that missing money on the morning of the murders and as late as four o'clock in the afternoon that they just, what, four hours, 45 minutes before for the slayings. I mean, that is right. And I, you know, she was a great witness. She was sharp um, and she really kind of talked about the building momentum that the firm and, and the, the actions that they were going to take to confront Mr. Murdoch. And it, she really helped the state's theory as well. If you're to believe their motive theory that all of this killing was Years done to distract, to buy more time for Alec Murdoch, which I personally don't believe is okay, so my, a motive my that are flies. But what that witness did say is that day. once uh, you know, his wife and his son were murdered, they backed off. They gave him time to grieve. And uh, I think the state could 
make an appropriate inference that that was the goal to give him time. So, but yeah, she was a she was a real savvy witness. Right. Depending on what financial evidence is permitted in this case, do you guys think the state rests their case next week or maybe the following week, or is it really going to matter on what the judge decides as far as what he's going to allow in? It really depends on the judge. I think he's going to be the one making the call, mm -hmm. and if he lets anything and everything regarding financial crimes come in, then the state will plow right through that, and, and it could be all week next week just on financial crimes. Right. If, he, if he limits it very narrowly and says, for example, talk about the confrontation that day, and that's all you get to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, bring in that in-house law firm accountant and a couple others to corroborate that, then that might add a day or two, and then we're, we're still moving where they'll probably finish next week. And that, maybe maybe get into a defense case. And then that is the state, the defense is itself, Brian. I mean, other than Murdoch taking the stand himself, they probably have a few witnesses to call on their own as well. You would think they would have some some witnesses to mm -hmm. attack this. Um, these are experienced trial lawyers. They've got a lot of resources. And if you're going to put up a case, often you want to be able to put up more than just your client. So right. we'll see. All right, Luke. Brian, not Luke Bryan, but Luke <laughs> Bryan, Luke and Brian Sheely. Guys, thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Again, if you would like to watch that trial.